11th, 2006, as part of the Library of Congress World War II History Project, and we have us with us today Mr. Joseph K. Orr, who's a native of the Atlanta area. His family uh, was originally from Connecticut and immigrated south to the Columbus area, and he knows the history of that area, plus the history of Atlanta beginning in 1920 when he was born in addition to World War II history. So we'd be asking him to share all of his historical perspective about the Atlanta area before, during, and after the war. And Joe, we appreciate very much you being with us today. Go for it. Thank you, David. Well, uh, my family, namely my great-grandfather, Forbes Bradley, was born in New Haven, Connecticut. And he and his brother moved south back in the eight, early 1800s and settled in Columbus, Georgia. He was a merchant there and he traded with the uh, Indians. He uh, even spoke their language. And when they moved the Indians out of the uh, eastern part of Alabama, he moved over there and uh, got as much land as he could take care of and built a home and raised a family with ten children, one of which was my grandmother. And uh, she later married my grandfather, Mr. J.K. Orr Sr., who was born in New York City and came down to Columbus to work with his great uncle, Mr. Joseph Kyle. And uh, he later got into the shoe, wholesale shoe business, and his business grew so that he needed to move to Atlanta. So in the 1890s, they moved to Atlanta. He built a home at the corner of 14th and Peachtree, and at the time he moved in, in 1902, it was, it was only one house further north on Peachtree, and that was the Murphy home on the corner of where Colony Square is today. I was born in that house in 1920, and uh, my family lived there until about 1931 or two, and then they, uh, my grandfather moved, and I lived in Ansley Park on the corner of Peace Street Circle in 16th with my mother, father, and two sisters. Uh, I went to school at North Avenue Presbyterian School out on uh, uh, Postelian Avenue through the sixth grade. Then I went to Peacock School for two years and then I went off to school at, in Virginia and in Rome, Georgia, and then to college at the Uni University of North Carolina. I've been in North Carolina a couple of years from the war was coming on, it looked like, and I decided to lay out of school for a year and go and put in my year of service and go back to school. After I'd been in the service a few months, World War, uh, the Japs attacked Pearl Harbor, and uh, my plans were shot then. I couldn't couldn't get out of the army. So I stayed in until they discharged me. While I was at Fort Mac, at the, one Sunday I was out playing golf with some friends, and I got home, my father said Pearl Harbor had been attacked. I couldn't hardly believe it, but anyhow, he said they'd called and from Fort Mac for me to get back out there as soon as possible. So. I called one of my friends who was stationed out there also. We'd been playing golf. I went by and picked him up, and we went back out to Fort Mac. And we were up there in the barracks, and we hadn't had much training. We'd, uh, all the basic training we'd had was uh, riot control and, and uh, parading. We paraded every Sunday for the visitors that came out to Fort Mac. And uh, they issued us uh, ammunition for our guns, and showed everybody didn't know how to load the gun, how to load it. And uh, they gave us helmets. And they backed the troop train into Fort Mac. And we slept in our clothes for two or three 
days because they didn't know what was going to happen. They didn't know whether we were going to be invaded by the Japs or what. So we were about the only troops they had available at that time. I worked in the reception center out there and we uh, processed up to a thousand men a day from uh, Alabama and Georgia. The, the blacks, they were all white, the blacks had a Another reception center they went into. I don't know where it was. But I left there and went up to Virginia, Fort Eustis, and uh, went through basic training again and got into OCS. And uh, at that time I got discharged with a bad back. So I, came, I got out of the service in 1943, which was pretty early. have a pause for a minute. Sure. Okay, I think we can pick up. Why don't you talk to us about well, some of your early remembrances of the 14th Street area and uh, the Depression years. And... Okay. Uh, growing up in Atlanta, during the Depression was quite an experience. They, uh, we lived near what was then called Collier Woods, mostly now at Sherwood Forest. It's, uh, but the, uh, there was a big hobo camp down there. And they'd get off the railroad as the trains came into the city. And uh, they'd go down there and they, they cooked uh, old fires and they had tin cans full of coffee and I'd swipe a few of my father's cigarettes and go down there and trade them for stories. These old bums would, uh, oh, they weren't bums, they were just people out of work. There wasn't any work anyway for anybody. And they would uh, tell all these tales about their travels and they were fascinating. I belonged to the Boy Scouts, like all and most of the other kids did. We just played roller skate hockey with a Prince Albert can and a stick. And uh, nobody had any money much, so we'd get a shoebox and a string and play with that if necessary. The, uh, I remember my mother would go down to 10th Street for a few dollars. She'd fill the car up with groceries. And, uh, anyhow, we, we, we got through that all right. The, uh, I was with my grandfather. On, he was on a business trip. He took me to New York City. And uh, one day he said, I'm going to take you to lunch somewhere and I don't want you to ever forget it. And he took me to a soup kitchen up, up near the wall off Astoria where we were staying. And you went in there, if you had a dime, you gave him a dime. If you didn't, the bowl of soup was free. They give you a bowl of soup and two slices of bread. And uh, you sit on long benches. And we sat there and ate our soup and bread. It was enough to suffice, but uh, people were hungry. Very little, little food, no work anywhere. And my grandfather was at a shoe manufacturing company, and he cut it, cut it back to three days a week, but he kept it open. Couldn't sell the shoes, so he just rented warehouse space and stored them, and uh, sold them later. But he kept the people there. They did have enough to buy something to eat and pay their rent with. They were making about three fifths of what they would ordinarily make. They, uh, we were probably a lot. <clears throat> a lot better off than the average person. So I can't 
can't say that we really suffered much. But, uh, it was a fascinating time. How did you uh, get to North Avenue Presbyterian School from 14th Street? Did you ride the trolley or drive a carpool? Or? No, they, uh, they, they drove us out there in the morning. And uh, we picked up some other children in the neighborhood. We had a car full. Was Ainsley Park developed about that time, or was it developed? Well, it was developed right at right at the turn of the century. About the house we lived in was built in 1907. It was built in 1907. So it was started developing in 1904, five, and six, seven. Long. It was a driving club there then. It was there. It, uh, it was there before the. Well, Piedmont Park was there. So they developed that park for the Cotton States Exposition. I think it was in 1890. <coughs> were the roads paved out as far as 14th Street? Or were they? they were, but 16th Street wasn't paved from Peach Street to Peach Street Circle. I remember when they paved that. Westminster was not paved, but uh, the main streets were. The big thoroughfares were. How about little streets like the Lafayette, the Fayette? Well, Westminster's right across from it. It it was paved later. I don't know when Lafayette was paved. What was the mood of the people, as you recall it, back during the thirties? Well, everybody was just. Uh, There wasn't a lot of joy, although everybody was trying to be as, as uh, make things as nice as they could. Uh, they, they uh, people would ring a doorbell wanting uh, something to eat. We always gave them a sandwich or something to eat. We never let them go away hungry, but my father wouldn't give them money. Were you all aware of the fact that children of the people who were committing suicide or taking their own lives because of financial woes? Oh yeah, yeah, that was, everybody knew that. In fact, we knew some people that took their own lives. When did you first become aware of the fact that there was a problem in Europe with Hitler doing what he was doing? Well, we studied about it in school, and uh, I remember reading about it in, the, in Time magazine about uh, Hitler trying to get control of having, they had many, many folks in Germany. In fact, I went to Europe in 1936, and the Spanish Civil War was going on then, and Germany was testing all their uh, tanks and planes and that. And they were involved in that, that confrontation. Did you think we would be involved in it at that time, or did you think we would have been able to remain neutral? Well, at that time, Hitler hadn't, uh, hadn't really done anything to it. He'd just gotten in power in about 1934. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but by the time I got to, got into high school in about 19, or later, uh, about, about 1937, or 8, 9, I think everybody realized sooner or later we were going to have to go. Do you remember when Hitler invaded Poland on September the 1st, 1939? Oh, yeah. What was your reaction to that? Was it still well, just another another step toward war? I mean, it was uh, that brought on that brought the English into the war. And, uh, I think that's what brought the England in when it, it was the invasion of Poland. I think that's when they started getting real antsy. Yeah. <laughs> because they knew they might be close to being next. Yeah. Uh, do you remember Dunkirk? Oh yeah. And what were your feelings about Dunkirk? Well, they were bad. 
That was a real serious blow. But they did get those men out. They did a great job doing it. They really did. Did the Battle of Britain that summer get much press? Oh, yeah. It, it, it. And I think everybody realized we were going to have to go to war. I, I did when I was in college. And I don't think, I think most of the kids there did, they, nobody studied real hard. They figured, you know, I'm, I'm going to be in the Army so long anyhow. I got feeling that way, that's the reason I decided I'd go get my year over with. But, uh, a lot of people were being, a lot of people were being drafted. Were you old enough to have remembered when Charles Lindbergh had a parade in Atlanta? I did. I sure did. You must have been pretty young at Bobby time. Jones, too. You remember the parade for Bobby Jones? I did. My father took me to a reception for him down the old athletic club. Down what Conway year was that? 1929, 1930? Somewhere back in there. Goodness gracious. You're the only person I've, <laughs> that I remember talking to. Them. We used to. My father belonged to the athletic club, and we'd go out to East Lake. And we'd go out there, and he'd say, there's Bobby Jones over there. I said, well, you couldn't hardly see this fellow. I said, well, how do you know? He said, I can tell the way he swings that golf club. Did you know Charlie Yates back then? I knew him later, yeah. But see, he must have been at that reception, too, for Bobby Jones. I would imagine. probably was. He did. Because he's a few years older than you are. Yeah, he's younger than Bobby. Though. Yeah, that's fascinating. Bobby was, uh, I had two uncles that were lawyers, and they were in the same firm with Bobby's father, Bobby Jones' father. Oh, is that right? What was the uh, mood of the country in terms of going to war? Charles Lindbergh was against the war. He was remaining an isolationist. isolationist thing. He was very pro-Nazi, uh, really. Came back and said that uh, you know Hitler was going to do all these things. So he, a lot of people looked down on him quite a bit. And he took that stance. Was the country divided, or was it? Well, I wouldn't say the country was divided; just a matter of different opinions. Okay, but they were still pretty well unified. To try to help solve the world's problems as best they could. Yeah, they, they realized we couldn't stay out of it. Did you know where Pearl Harbor was when your father called you and told you when you I had there? been to Hawaii. I knew exactly where it was. And that's one reason I couldn't hardly believe that they had attacked it because Roosevelt was out there at the same time I was there and they had a, we went to a, uh, military review for, for the president and uh, out at <clears throat> Schofield Barrett and uh, just all this military my planes and tanks and guns and, and uh, they said it was the most heavily fortified island in the world and uh, it's heavy to attack with couldn't fight back hard. It was just unconceivable to me. You remember what year you went to Hawaii? 1934. Goodness gracious. The uh, Waikiki Beach. There was two hotels on the beach and nothing else, just palm trees. And I uh, told my grandfather a for sale sign on a lot there. I said, you ought to buy that lot. He says, it's too far from home. <laughs> What was your father's uh, shoe business? Where was it? Yes, where was it located? Well, they had a building at uh, Auburn Avenue, 32 Auburn Avenue, and uh, they had a shoe factory out off, right off Edgewood. Um, uh, they changed the name of the street, but it used to be on uh, Young Street, Y-O-N-G-E. How many people did it employ? Do you remember? I think uh, several hundred. 
So it was a pretty big business at that time. The uh, building's still there and it's been turned into a uh, home for the mentally retarded homeless. Oh, goodness. And uh, they made it into a nice apartment building. Have their own kitchen and rec room and everything. How did you uh, feel when you got out of the military in 1943? By that time, were you disappointed that you couldn't stay in or were you glad to be through? Or Well, I was disappointed I couldn't stay in, I, but if I couldn't, I was glad to get out. <laughs> but uh, I, I glad to get home. I came home and uh, I went to work. Started raising a family. Were you married at that time? I was married. Before the war started? Or? No, I was married during the war. During the war? And when you came home, did you go back into the family business? No, they, it, uh, it wasn't then. It, 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 uh, they had sold it to, uh, to uh, General Shu. Okay. And, uh, the business was still there, but I mean, it, my family didn't have anything to do with it. So uh, I started off in the real estate business there just wasn't anything to sell, so anything that was uh, rented you couldn't sell. And people didn't want to move out of their home, they couldn't build anything else, so every, everything was ready on standstill. So uh, I went to work for an insurance company. Did that till I went into the food business. How did you get into the food business? Just by chance. Uh, we were looking for something to get into, and there was a little <clears throat> margarine plant up in Cedar Town that was for sale, and we looked at it. And we didn't like the what they had, but. We looked into the business and thought we might just start a no. So we did here in Atlanta. Who, who is we? We is my brother-in-law and myself. Okay. And what was the what was the name of the company that you? The Mago Corporation. We manufactured uh, margarine under our label, Mago, and also under many other labels for other people. And how long did it take to get that business established? Uh, several years to get it established. And it, it became a pretty big business, did it, it not? It did. We, we produced uh, 25 million pounds a year. And it sold all over? We covered uh, 14 states and did business in 21. And sold to the whole retail grocers? Wholesale grocers. Wholesale grocers. Distributors, chain public. And you stayed in that business for till what year? Well, I sold it in '59. And what did you do after that? Well, after that, I, uh, I, I went into the packaging business and I sold the packaging that uh, the market people used. I, I covered the whole country. There weren't but 26 people in the modern business. Oh, is that right? So, and I knew them all, so I, my old competitors became my potential customers. So I, I sold the paper that they wrapped oh, modern. Right. You your precursor to print pack? Similar to print pack. Huh? What Erskine Love developed later on? But he didn't, he didn't sell to the margarine people, did he? Did what? He didn't sell to the margarine people, did he? Print back? Yes. I sold some for him. Oh, you did? Yeah. <laughs> he, he didn't like the business much. He decided he didn't want it. <laughs> what is your feeling about the attitude of the country today in terms of its situation in the world with Iraq compared to what was going on back during World War II? 
Well, I don't know how to compare it to World War II. Uh, I have my feelings about it, and they're very mixed. I, uh, I'd like to see us get out of there by the same token. I understand the necessity to, to uh, bring this thing to a victorious conclusion. Uh, it's hard to balance it, too. One day I think one way, another day I think of the other way. Do you think there was much as much ambivalence back during World War II when Lindbergh was pro Hitler and uh, versus the rest of the country? No, I don't think anybody paying attention to him. They, they just uh, did what they had to do. It just wasn't, it wasn't it just as people in service with everybody. Now you have how many children? I have four children. How many grandchildren? Five. And are they in the Atlanta area? Uh huh. All of them. Except one, that, one grandson that's in school in Utah. Don't ask me how he got out there. <laughs> Probably flew. <laughs> Do you remember the Atlanta airport developing? Oh, yeah. yeah. Remember the first airplane you rode on or saw? Yeah, it was a DC-2. I flew from Washington to Atlanta. How old were you when that occurred? Oh, 15, I guess. Was it still named Candler Field out there then? That's all I knew it had. They had a little manila colored air terminal at that yeah, time. They did. It had about two rooms and a little tile in the middle. Tower, I remember that growing up. You remember, I remember when? The, I remember it when it had, a, had the banks around it where they had a racetrack there, an automobile racetrack. I forgot about that. That's how it got called Candler Field. That was Canada's had a racetrack out there. And they donated it to the air, for the airport. I forgot that. What kind of thoughts or feelings would you like to leave your children or grandchildren with about what they ought to do to, with their lives, knowing what you know and you know about the history of the country in well, your lifetime? The older I get, the less I know. <laughs> Some of these youngsters, they they live in a different world. They got to make their own decisions. I think. They, uh, I've seen so many changes that ten years from now we won't recognize what it's like today. I think you're right. Were you ever scared about World War Two? No. Not for us. I was. Uh, I got scared for Britain. It looked like they were just taking a terrible beating over there. I don't. I don't think many people thought they were going to be able to pull through. That's a pretty big ocean between us. Well, and John, I think that's when John Ridley started going on convoys in the North Atlantic right after the Battle of Britain. Or sometime during 1940-41 is when he started going over there. Yeah, that was rough duty. What's your favorite thoughts about Atlanta that you can remember through the last 60, 70 years? Well, I, I just, I don't know, it's my home. I think it's a great place to live. I don't know of any place I'd, I'd move to if I had my choice. I 
just to stay him. So I, I don't know. Of the mayors we've had, which ones do you think did the best job? Well, I think without any doubt, Hartsfield did. I think he made it, like, had a lot to do with it, uh, making it a, a air track hub, building that airport. He was mayor for how many years? Do you remember? It must have been See, 20. Right, for Elmer, back in those days. Yeah, he was mayor for around 20 years, wasn't he? Something it? like that, or maybe more. There was one period when he kind of Crawl got in for one session there. But Hartsfield came back, won his uh, seat back. What do you think about Ivan Allen's tenure? Well, I think he was a, he was a good man. I think he, at the time he he probably had a harder job as mayor than any of them. He came along at the, the time when we really had some problems, and he solved them pretty well. He did a wonderful job. Yeah. I think everybody thinks he did that. What do you think about the growth in Delano in your lifetime? It was just a small metropolis when you started. Yeah, it was, I remember when it hit 100,000 people. Everybody, thought that was enormous. Do you remember how old you were then? I was, I was probably 11 or 12, something like that. So that was around 1931 or 1932? I guess the 32 census brought us so that's probably. And what kind of tra public transportation did they have about that time? Well, they, they had a wonderful bus system. And, uh, everybody rode the bus. It was standing room only in the afternoon from downtown to out Peach Street, out West Peach Street to Buckhead. These are the trolleys with the well, over Either here. that or just gasoline trolleys. Those were the uh, trackless trolleys that had the wire oh. connections to them. You remember what year they got put in? I know they were here when I was yeah. growing up in, in the, the 40s. 30s or 40s. So it must have been in the 1930s that they were installed. But uh, we had, a, we had, I think, the best bus system in the city I'd ever seen. But Atlanta uh, didn't have any very many parking facilities, so people rode the bus. But now every, nobody wants to ride Marta. It just really doesn't go where they want to go. Do you remember the Weinkauf fire in 1946? I did. <coughs> did you go down there and see I, that? I slept through it. I didn't even know it was happening. That was on a Saturday night, as I recall. And you heard about it on Sunday morning. Did you know anybody who was lost during that fire? No, I don't think I did. Was there much crime in Atlanta when you grew up? See, if there was, I, I didn't know it. You're At one time, there was a lot of crime in there. The rod, rod, they call them the uh, rod, rob ride bandits. All the cars had running boards on them in those days. And, they jump on the car with a pistol in their hand on the running board. If you stopped at a light, they just sort of kidnap you in the car and uh, get your money, and then they get out and run. <laughs> but they put a stop to that right quick. They just asked everybody to carry a pistol with them, and it quit overnight. Is that right? So. The answer to the crime was to arm everybody and that's that. right. Did any civilians use pistols to your knowledge or did they just throw it off? I don't think they had to. I think if Rod, Rod, Rod Rod bandits quit. How <laughs> oh, we dead gone. That's fascinating. What was the old Collier estate like? 
when the, the hobos were down there? Was that farmland or Yeah, no, it was just woods. Just woods, just probably. Wood, yeah. And uh, we used to go down and play all the time. You know, they had a, that, uh, well, that was an adventure for kids, you know, go down to deep woods. And that was a we pretty good walk for them. Did you have adult supervision or would you walk from the hall? Oh, yeah. Supervision at all. And just as a 10, 11, 12 year old, you'd walk that far away from all because that's oh, yeah. a pretty good hike down there. One, two, three blocks. Well, well long well, blocks. Well, yeah, they two, about two blocks. We'd get in down there at uh, the Prado and Peachtree Circle. Because it came up, it was Beverly Road was cut there. Wasn't, that. wasn't there then, I see. So it was, the state came over that far. I'll be that young. Well, any other thoughts you've got that you'd like to share? I don't think so. You helped me bring back a lot of memories. Where was your wife from? Was she from Atlanta also? She was born here. My father was with Procter and Gamble. They moved away when she was uh, eight or nine and moved to Dallas and then to Chicago. Back to Atlanta. And you met her back here during the war and then you got married? Well, after the war. Yeah. This is my second wife. Oh, I see. Well, I'm so glad that you've been willing to share some thoughts about the area and your life with us. We appreciate it. Thank you, David. I enjoyed it. I got to go to E River School while you were in the military. And started Miss Bloodworth's kindergarten in the E River School and then Ended up in Naps, and I mentioned that my generation expresses a great deal of gratitude to your generation, your willingness, even though you didn't see active combat, you were willing to go into the military until they drummed you out for being physically unfit. So you, you did your share. We're very much indebted to you. Thank you. Thanks so much.